Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansen. Tonight, the Prime Minister meets the President of Ukraine in Kyiv. Putin and his accomplices will fail. Ukraine will prevail. Slava Ukraini. A surprise visit. The Canadian flag flies again in Kyiv as the embassy reopens. How the trip came together and why the country saw a flurry of Western visits this weekend. Also tonight, Canadians cope with sky-high gas prices. It can't keep going like this. It's starting to feel it. And we're seeing these prices being reflected in the retail stores, in the grocery chains. The first Mother's Day since the end of COVID restrictions. It's nice to be out and about. Good for moms, good for business. And... Guys, I knew we should have cryogenically frozen our bodies. Yeah. We go behind the scenes of the Kids in the Hall reboot. What's it like to be back together? How writing comedy has changed. I have an 18-year-old daughter who tells me daily what we can't do. Plus, who they say is the most important character they've ever done. This is The National. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has arrived in war-torn Ukraine at a critical moment with civilians in the country dying and the Eastern Front engulfed in artillery fire, Trudeau went to symbolize support and confidence in Ukraine's resistance to the Russian invasion. Canadians uh, will not be deterred in our resolve to stand with Ukraine and stand against Russia. The Prime Minister's arrival in Kyiv coincides with VE Day, marking the Allies' victory over Nazi Germany in the Second World War. And it comes on the eve of a similar celebration in Russia that some fear could mark an escalation of the war in Ukraine. As Boris George shows us, Trudeau's visit came with a promise to do what's possible to deny Russia victory in Ukraine. The brutalized suburb of Irpin, the first stop for Canada's delegation, Prime Minister Trudeau, along with Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland <laughs> and Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie briefly toured these streets before moving on to the capital to reopen Canada's embassy. <laughs> this flag came down on February 13th uh, and uh, we're really glad to be raising it again above the Canadian embassy. Canada had faced some criticism for not moving its diplomatic staff back earlier, but there was nothing but warm words from Ukraine's president, who didn't publicly press Canada to send in heavy weapons, but expressed gratitude for the government committing more than $1 billion in financial aid. Canada is second after the U.S. in terms of the scope of assistance, Volodymyr Zelensky said. Away from the relative stability of the capital, war rages in the country's east. Ukraine says this school in the Luhansk region was leveled by a bomb, killing as many as 60 people sheltering there. Officials say all civilians have now been evacuated from the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol. But Ukrainian fighters remain holed up inside, refusing to surrender. Many are from the Azov Regiment, a far-right armed group that was folded into Ukraine's National Guard. During the Prime Minister's visit, he called Putin's actions heinous and an affront to those who fought for Allied forces during World War II. What Vladimir Putin is doing today, these past weeks, brings shame on the memory of the millions of people, the millions of Russians who sacrificed in the name of freedom. Breyer, you mentioned there has been some criticism for how long it's taken, but the timing of Trudeau's visit is symbolic. It is, and that's because Russia is poised to commemorate Victory Day tomorrow. It's a large national holiday in the country, and it's when Russians mark uh, the country's victory over Nazi Germany. But certainly Canada's visit to Ukraine today was not just about symbolism. The government made a series of promises. They said that there would be more funding for Ukraine so teams could go out and clear landmines from communities. And also the government is going to be sending Ukraine more equipment, including cameras that are being put on drones and satellite imagery. Ian. All right, Barry Stewart reporting from Kyiv tonight. 
Let's turn to Katie Simpson for more on how the trip came together. And Katie, you have some behind the scenes details about how Trudeau's trip was planned. Yeah, these plans have been in the work for weeks, Ian. I'm told the Prime Minister was keen to go and his team supported it. So staff in the Prime Minister's office reached out to allies who had already gone into Ukraine to find out what their experiences had been like. According to a source with direct knowledge of the situation, there were at least two calls, one with staff in European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's office and another call with staff in British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's office. There were two key takeaways from from those conversations. One, even if you go in with your own security, you are in the hands of the Ukrainian military and you have to be comfortable with that. Two, do not expect the trip to be kept a secret. These kinds of high-risk visits often come with an embargo. The public is not supposed to know about the trip until the Prime Minister is out of the high-risk situation. While that was supposed to be the case for Boris Johnson, it didn't happen. And that was supposed to be the case for the U.S. Secretary of State and the U.S. Secretary of Defense. That didn't happen. And today, with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, again, that didn't happen. But there was a high-profile visit, Katie, today that was kept secret. Yeah, First Lady Jill Biden secretly crossed into the western part of Ukraine for a mission of her own. Ukraine's First Lady emerged from hiding for one of the most remarkable displays of support in this war so far. First Lady Jill Biden on Ukrainian soil to personally deliver a message. The people of the United States stand with the people of Ukraine. On the same day in the capital. This evening, 8th of May, shots will ring out. In the Ukraine sky, but you will be free at last. At the request of President Zelensky, Bono and the Edge of the band U2 played what they call a freedom concert, an hour-long set in a busy Kiev metro station, inviting Ukrainian soldiers to join them. It's no coincidence all of these public displays are happening now. On the eve of Russia's May 9th Victory Day celebrations, Western allies are trying to show Russia it is not on the eve of victory in Ukraine. They have nothing to celebrate tomorrow. They have only succeeded in isolating themselves internationally and becoming a pariah state. G7 leaders took fresh action to emphasize that point. During an hour-long video call, all agreed to phase out Russian oil. The U.S. introduced more sanctions against Russian bankers and media outlets, along with new visa restrictions, while the U.K. pledged another $2 billion in weapons and military aid. It's critical that we all do everything possible to stop the war that Russian regime, very much like Nazi regime, started in Europe again. In standing by Ukraine, the U.S. is defending its decision to share intelligence that reportedly has helped Ukraine target Russian generals and ships, arguing they're passing along the information. It's up to Ukraine how they use it. Ian. Katie Simpson in Washington, thank you. Thanks. Turning to this country now as gas prices continue to hit record highs. One litre of regular is now at or above $2 in much of the country. In St. John's, it's 203 even higher in Montreal at just under 208 In Toronto, hovering just below $2. And then there's Vancouver, almost $2.23 a litre, easily the most expensive place to fill up in Canada. And it's not just filling the tank that's getting more expensive. Far Morale shows us how the rising cost of fuel affects the cost of everything else. At most Toronto gas stations, prices shot up four cents a litre. Many drivers are putting in just what they need. I just got to get to Oakville for Mother's Day and I'm going to fill up just enough to get there. Before was like $70, $80, but now even it crossed the 100 and not even full. From Toronto to Vancouver to Montreal and elsewhere, the sticker shock is real. The skyrocketing price of crude oil to blame. As the economy started to come out of COVID, there wasn't enough production. Compound that with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and we end up in a situation where nobody knows where the oil price globally is going to go. While it's drivers feeling the pain at the pumps now, other consumers can expect to feel the ripple effects too. 
Businesses that transport goods across Canada say there's only so much cost they can absorb before passing it down to the consumer. We're seeing these, these prices being reflected in the retail stores, in the grocery chains. The price of diesel, also above $2 a litre in much of Canada. This trucking company estimates per month, each truck costs them an extra $10,000. When we look at those numbers and we say, OK, well, you know, trucking doesn't have those type of margins, uh, so that cost does get passed down somewhere, and it just requires us having those conversations. They're difficult conversations to have. Difficult conversations, something Sue Monroy knows well. Not only are donations down at his food bank charity, but they're struggling to even deliver food to people in need. Our buses and trucks that takes our food to the different food banks and our soup kitchens, are the money we need to fill up our tanks, have gone up at least around 30% in the last little while. And if you consider year over year, it's almost 60%, which for a small charity, it's very difficult. Hopefully we hit the peak soon. We'll go back down, can't keep going like this. <laughs> sure. Starting to feel it. With high prices and volatility expected to continue, that peak may be still a ways away. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Let's bring in Dan McTagg, the president of Canadians for Affordable Energy. And Dan, I want to pick up on something Farah touched on, and that is the peak to these gas prices. Any idea when we're going to hit that? No, uh, probably better at choosing next week's lottery numbers. Uh, no, I, I think you're going to see prices move up a little higher. Uh, we haven't hit the summertime driving season yet, and although the prices would have a lot of people thinking twice about doing that, it's not stopping the airline companies. It's certainly not stopping bookings. It looks like we're going to continue to see prices rise as much as 10 cents a litre between now on average and the May 2-4 weekend. Of course, the United States starts the Memorial Day weekend. Their kickoff to summer driving the week later. These are the high price periods uh, right from, you know, uh, May until September. So I don't see any relief in sight, at least uh, for the foreseeable future. There is, and I know you've heard this before, suspicion over the gas companies, the oil companies. They're rubbing their hands in glee, perhaps, making all this money. Uh, is the fix in? Is, is this actually instead a competitive business? Well, look, I'm not a big fan of the oil companies, and they're tickled pink when I uh, reveal their gas price strategies a couple of days before they're able to change them. Uh, but uh, they're really price takers. Uh, the price is set in New York and Chicago and uh, the Pacific Northwest for gasoline that we pay here in Canada. Gas stations have control maybe over the last seven to nine cents a litre, but ultimately... Uh, the decision in terms of the price we pay has everything to do with what markets are doing, and they are an upswing, and not just for gasoline, but for diesel, jet fuel, uh, even natural gas, two and a half times the price it was just this time last year. We're in an energy super cycle, and it's going to get uh, a lot more painful before it settles down. Dan McTagg, thanks for the analysis. My pleasure, Ian. Thank you. This is the first Mother's Day since the pandemic began with few public health restrictions. As Olivia Stefanovic shows us, it's a welcome change for families and businesses. Today, many welcome the return of Mother's Day traditions. This is just a real delight. I couldn't ask for a better Mother's Day. It's much different for sure. Uh, previous Mother's Day, we've kind of celebrated at home, but it's nice to be out and about. The first brunch of its kind in years. We planned to come here two years ago in May. We had a reservation and then COVID happened and we couldn't come. So we tried for last year and then and then they got locked down again. A nice change for Ann Petty and her daughters from being confined by COVID restrictions. I've been so excited to come here and we finally get to. I mean, third time's the charm. Especially on a day like this. Some days it's like five degrees and raining, but today we get this gorgeous breeze and the, and the sun. A much needed boost for business too. We've been closed and open and closed and open. It's been, it's been hard. The restaurant isn't quite as busy as it was pre-pandemic, but at least it's a start. I think we'll get there. Would you like a receipt? But at this flower shop east of downtown Ottawa. Thank you, bye. 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 A trend started in the pandemic is sticking around. Wow, uh, business is actually picking up. People are more interested in sending flowers more than ever to reach out to their loved ones for special occasions where they can't be there. But now that more people can see each other in person, epidemiologists are reminding people COVID's still out there. I'm mostly concerned about people visiting their elderly mothers or elderly grandmothers who are obviously of higher risk of bad COVID outcomes. Not a problem for families crowding Toronto's High Park to see the cherry blossoms. 
For the last two years, the cherry trees were fenced off to visitors during peak flowering. It's lovely just to spend time with my son and my friends and enjoy the nice weather. A treat that feels like a fresh start to a new normal. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. With rain in the forecast in Manitoba, a First Nation community is bracing for more tough days ahead. Pegwa's First Nation has already seen some of its worst flooding in years. As Emily Brass explains, the community is doing what it can to save homes right now, but says it needs far more help to protect against flooding in the future. Pegwa's First Nation is shoring up the edges of its main road. The water's going down in the south end of the community, but more is on the way with another 20 to 30 millimeters of rain in Monday's forecast. Sandbagging continues around the clock as people do whatever they can to hold the water back. It's the fourth major flood to hit the community in 12 years. This time, the river reached its highest level yet. 700 homes have been evacuated so far, 200 completely submerged. Experts say springtime floods will only get worse with climate change. They say the community needs better flood protection, like ditches and dikes. It's something the First Nation says it's been asking the government for for decades, but it hasn't come. Because we're First Nations people. Uh, when you look at other communities that have been impacted, um, they, they have all the protection in the world. But when it comes to our communities, this is the result. The local food bank is working hard to bring staples to people stranded in their homes for over a week. It's very scary and a lot of work and it takes so much time to do it, but just hopefully everybody will be safe. She says supplies are running low and so are people's spirits. Volunteers met up at Pegua Central School to try to change that. We bought them nice coffee cups. They made hundreds of gift bags so kids could give their moms something special for Mother's Day. The school sent money to community members now in Winnipeg after they were forced to leave their homes. They went shopping and sent the gifts back home. To commemorate all our mothers out there who are fighting the battle with the floodwaters once again. And uh, just a reminder that they are the backbone of our community and they will be the ones to propel us through. A bit of brightness with more hard days ahead. Emily Brass, CBC News, Pegwa's First Nation, Manitoba. Several other First Nations communities are also facing flooding right now. That emergency siren is only a test, but residents of Katlao Deche First Nation are on high alert. The community is located along the Hay River in the Northwest Territories. There is only one way in and out. And residents have been warned if they hear that siren again, they need to leave immediately. Several homes in low-lying areas have already been evacuated. And in northern Ontario, two neighboring communities are being evacuated due to flooding. The Kashechewan and Fort Albany First Nations are along the James Bay coast. Residents have been flown south to Thunder Bay and several other municipalities. The federal government says it's working with both communities on the evacuation efforts. The pandemic spurred many creative ideas to help small businesses stay afloat. One Victoria man had an idea you may have seen to preserve safe outdoor seating at his coffee shop during COVID health restrictions. But when he tried to sell the idea to others, it nearly cost him thousands of dollars. Caroline Bargut explains in this Go Public investigation. Channing Chan owns three coffee shops in Victoria. When the pandemic hit, he came up with a creative idea to keep customers safe. Chan ordered geodesic domes similar to these from a manufacturer in China and placed them over tables on his cafe's patio. Soon, Chan and his friend Natalia Capitanova decided to go into business together, importing and selling the domes on e-commerce platform Shopify as Wiglu Tent Company. We thought it was going to be so exciting to bring it over here. Raymond Young from Whitby, Ontario, ordered 10 domes from them last May. He wanted to host campers that summer and was told the items would likely arrive within six to eight weeks. But COVID delayed delivery for months. Young wanted his money back and initiated what's called a chargeback with his credit card company, BMO. Young spoke with Go Public in an audio interview. We only did the chargeback because we didn't think we were getting them. But eventually, Young did get the domes and started renting some of them out. Still, BMO approved the refund. How can it be possible to get the product to have the money and have no consequences whatsoever. 
Young says he intended to pay for the domes after he got them, but not at full price because he says they arrived damaged. Wigloo assumed Shopify would advocate on their behalf after sending them documents showing the domes had been delivered. But Shopify never forwarded that evidence to the buyer's bank. They were out of luck and out of options. We don't know where to start to solve the problem. In Shopify, we don't know. There's no contact person. After GoPublic reached Shopify, the company admitted it made a mistake and gave Wigloo its $18,000 back. Young got to keep his refund too. Corrine Pullman of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business says Shopify dropped the ball. There's that middleman simply because that's where the relationship is with the merchant. And that's part of the ongoing complexity of this industry. Chan and Capitanova ditched Shopify and now sell the domes on their own. As for the damage to the domes, Wigloo and Young still haven't resolved that dispute. Caroline Barkut, CBC News, Winnipeg. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. For one family, it's a Mother's Day reunion, a lifetime in the making. Oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. This is so amazing. Coming up, a mother was forced to give up her daughter. Eight decades later, how they found each other. A miracle. Plus, as the Philippines goes to the polls in a divisive election, how it's playing out in this country. Families, friends, they are divided. And... Back off, pigs, or the tower gets crashed. The kids are back, older but just as cutting. What's it like making their brand of comedy almost 30 years later? I do think we are in a, a satire-deficient era. We're back right after this. Congratulations. A Beijing loyalist has been voted in as Hong Kong's new leader. John Lee was declared the winner today after a tightly controlled election in which he was the only candidate. The former Hong Kong security chief oversaw the crackdown on pro-democracy protests. His appointment widely seen as another sign of Beijing's tightening control of the territory. Lee takes over from outgoing leader Carrie Lam in July. And some new video tonight of a polling station in the Philippines where it's now Monday and voting underway to choose the country's next president. Whoever wins will take over from populist leader Rodrigo Duterte. As Lindsay Duncombe reports, with a lot at stake, many in Canada's Filipino community have been doing what they can to have their say. Filipino Canadians come to this new Westminster, B.C. supermarket to send money home, a practice common across Canada. These days, cash can come with something else, political pressure. The voice of somebody who is here in Canada is very strong when it comes uh, to influencing their families back home. There you go. Owner Connie Vacaleris didn't pay much attention to politics before the election, but this is different. Families, friends, they are divided. In the Philippines, um, politics is a blood sport. Thank you. Susanna Lorenzo Thank worries about her Susanna. nieces and nephews in the Philippines and knows who she wants them to vote for. Baby and Sarah! Yeah. Her cheer is for the front runner, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., known as Bongbong Bong Marcos or BBM. He's the son of dictator Ferdinand Marcos, overthrown in 1986. The corruption and excess of the elder Marcos regime was symbolized by his wife Imelda's opulent shoe collection. Through social media, Bong Bong has rebranded his family legacy from brutality to a golden age of prosperity. Marcos Jr.'s vice presidential running mate is the daughter of current strongman President Rodrigo Duterte. His extrajudicial war on drugs killed thousands of people, and that scares some Filipino Canadians. My biggest fear is this will spell the doom of the Philippines. He's one of 90,000 Filipinos living in Canada registered to vote in this election. He voted for Marcos' main rival, the current vice president, human rights lawyer Lenny Robredo. The message behind what's been called her pink revolution, that Filipino democracy is at stake. <laughs> Hundreds have turned out at rallies for Robredo in Canadian cities too. But the most 
glaring fact of this matchup is good versus evil. Baby and Sarah. Politics doesn't get much more intense, even thousands of kilometers away. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. After the break, the kids in the hall are back together again. I can make the word Canadian sound sexy. <laughs> but they tell me 30 years later, their comedy faces a, a different kind of pushback. Networks, everyone's terrified of Twitter. Their no holes barred conversation is next. <laughs> I mean, I'm only cussing your heads. Cuss you. You're boring me. I'm cussing your head. I'm cussing your head. What are you doing? They probably didn't realize it at the time, but that Kids in the Hall skit would become a classic of Canadian comedy. Just one of the bizarre characters invented by a comedy troupe many considered ahead of their time. It's been more than 30 years since Kids in the Hall burst onto the scene. They have changed a lot since then, but in some ways, they're still exactly the same. I sat down with them as they were filming their brand new comedy series. I think we're ready to start the show and let the slaughter begin! Let's get something going. Unexpected moments and quirky characters. That was classic kids. What are you? God, you're not too bright. I'm a chicken lady. 30 years later, lots of comics praise kids in the hall as groundbreaking iconic and influential. I can make the word Canadian sound sexy. <laughs> After a successful run on CBC and HBO in the 90s, the kids eventually went their separate ways. Let's meet back here in an hour with some ideas. Including Dave Foley on the 90s sitcom News Radio, and more recently, Mark McKinney on Superstore. Have a heavenly day. Now all five kids are back on Amazon Prime Video. Guys, I knew we should have cryogenically frozen our bodies. Yeah. Or even just our faces. Oh. Or even just your hair. Oh. <laughs> the new series features lots of new sketches, and yeah, some of their classic characters are back. Back off, pigs, or the tower gets crashed. Yeah. And action. We were given exclusive access during a day of filming in Toronto for the Kids in the Hall reboot. And I'm your friendly neighborhood DJ, Motormouth Montaigne, on KROC, the Crocodile. Once the sketch is wrapped, our cameras started rolling, and we sat down to talk. As you'll see, it was a freewheeling interview. The kids have been quite open about how much conflict there was behind the scenes of their original series. So to start, I asked them, all these years later, What's it like to be back together? Um, oh, 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 good. With, the exception, with the exception of the lawsuits, no. Yeah. Um, it, this is actually the joy of my career now, that it's full, mm -hmm. that it's full circle, that we get to come and Line do this. Line reporters is the joy of your career? Yes, that's my <laughs> great um, It's really been a blast. You know, we've, we've stayed together doing tours since the, uh, you know, we're off the air. But there's nothing like doing this, and we're really excited, happy yeah. to be doing it. And are you guys getting along? Uh, yeah, like we always do. Part, yeah. yeah. What's uh, our yeah. What's our uh, uh, What's our agreed on response? I'd less fighting than usual. Yeah. 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 That, it's not the best it's ever been. Yeah. Maybe, which is yeah. a bad sign. Yeah. It's hard to what? fight and argue yeah. when you're older. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it <laughs> is. I mean, people mellow sometimes when they get older, or sometimes they become more ornery. An old-fashioned uh -huh. word that's only associated yeah. with older people. Uh, which Which way are you guys going? I think nicer. Oh, think definitely, definitely nicer. nicer. Yeah. We're Definitely. pleasantly ornery. I think yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah we're I'm not even ornery. I yeah. still think we're ornery between action and cut. Yes. Right? I know what he means. I know what he means. Yeah. We still have the, the edge. Yeah, that's Scott right. took your word ornery and substituted vital. Yes. Yeah. And fiery. Yeah. He and wants to say that he tiger. was amazing. So, yeah. yeah, there'll be an argument about that later. Yeah. What else has changed over the years uh, besides your demeanor? It, and it, waist sizes. Uh, yeah. But do you feel that your sense of humor or what makes you mad or what you find funny has changed? I feel like your answer would be a, an emphatic yes to that. <laughs> That's a very good question. No one wants to know that I'm gay. And even less people want to know that I'm Canadian. <laughs> of course, a lot has changed since the 90s. There's virtually nothing from a Buddy Cole skit satirizing racial stereotypes that we felt we could play now. It reminds me of something that Yoko Ono once said to Malcolm X. 
when I look at that, that, that clip, which we laughed at at the time, as you say, we played at the CBC, I'm thinking there's no way that could air right now, right? Oh. Has that been a bit of a challenge to try to figure out what you're even quote unquote allowed to do now? Hmm. Well, no, because we keep being told uh, what we're not allowed to do. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's I mean, I, th I hope there's going to come a correction where we stop siloing all of humanity into very narrow categories and actually start to be able to interact with each other again and talk to each other and, and share points of view about, about a multitude of subjects. So how, how, do you, how do you figure that out? How do you gauge what you, like I feel like when you guys were much younger, you just went with your instincts. And, and especially in Canada, maybe you had a little bit more latitude. Yeah, but then again, like in, when we were censored in those days, it was usually coming from the political right and you know, like the, the Christian right mostly yes. would be the people that would be They're angry at us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and now it's just, you know, now most of the censorship is coming from the political left. And it's coming via social media, not, not necessarily yeah. network executives, but people. Oh, no, that terrible. too. But they're all, yeah, but they, all the networks, all networks and everyone, everyone's terrified of, everyone's terrified of Twitter. But, but Ian, also there is the ex extreme where there are things that you can't do and, prob and shouldn't do now. Um, but I also do like that the center of, of society now that compassion for things is, is a really important thing. And for me, in the little journey I've had in my life, I like that. I like to think about the effect that what you're saying or doing may have on people, because we never did before. Um, and so I, I, I like that responsibility now. Well, now we're at the point where we've evolved into sort of where we judge our stuff a little bit more, while trying to maintain the kind of lack of self-consciousness that you need for creativity mm -hmm. but we're definitely we definitely matured and i completely uh, yeah. agree with bruce and you I, want to be a more compassionate yeah. and i have person. an 18 year old daughter who tells me daily what we can't do <laughs> <laughs> now i thought you were going to talk more in this segment of the interview than you have are you holding yourself back i'm just here to be pretty <laughs> <laughs> and isn't he succeeding in that Come on. Yeah. Is, is buddy cole part of the reboot as I said, I'm just here to be here. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yes. And by the way, I'm just but, saying, I, I, go ahead. I wish that this compassion that everybody speaks about could be extended to people like me. And that's about all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I will say, Buddy Cole is the most important character I think we've ever done. And when I saw his one man show, that's when I wanted to do the reboot because it was so brilliant. Yeah. And I still, I still yeah, I get, I still get messages on on Twitter and all over the place from kids who say that that, that seeing Buddy on on uh, CBC act saved their lives. And oh, in my like, workshops, like, I heard that every workshop. I saw one yesterday, and it was a young woman who said, "I grew up in a violent, disturbed household, and Buddy Cole showed me the door." When I, that's that's its yeah, effect in 1993. Yeah, yeah. But to be clear, what I was referring to is on on the skit about or the sketch about race oh, I know. is is just the words and and the concepts that at the time we just took as what seemed obvious to many of us, which was satire, right? It was a belief that people had out there, and you, you, the fact that you could say it out loud on TV was pleasantly shocking enough and that your character could turn it upside down was even better. But I kind of feel, I may be wrong, but I feel like in 2021, if that sketch just landed on the air, all people- I wouldn't be in this interview. Yeah, yeah people would just be tweeting out certain well, words I, out of context. Well, I, I'm just gonna say, I do think we are in a, a satire deficient era. Yeah. And I find that uh, troubling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to me that I look so good. <laughs> yeah. Can I say we are we're living in a context embargo? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know. that's actually so good phrase. Dave said that he thought it was a good line. He <laughs> took the idea I was trying to work at. <laughs> it is a great line. I mean, you actually do really seem to be enjoying being together, and you seem to be getting along together. That's that's yeah. that that isn't that that's weird? Such an understatement. Well, yeah. and it's also this: when we were young men. We didn't know who we were in the world. And so we were very competitive with each other. And now, as our lives have evolved, we realize it's only each other. That's and right. there's no competition anymore, because look at us. That's true, it was uh, in, the, in our 20s, it was, I gotta get that scene in the show. And now your scene's been cut. Oh good, I have a day off. <laughs> <laughs> but this is like the world's coolest high school reunion. Except it's lasting for a few weeks and you guys are super creative and you get to hang out and you don't have to swagger or, or you know, it's just a yeah. different kind of vibe, but it's going to come to an end. No, uh, no, it won't. Mm -hmm. The only way it'll come to an end is a tombstone. 
Yes. And we will never stop. Yeah. We are we are the blues musicians that we all loved growing up. Yeah. John Lee Hooker, he played to his eighties, right? Until they yeah. make us stop. Yeah. I mean yeah. we haven't been around all the time, but it's we've true. always we keep we'll, we we'll keep coming stop. back together yeah. every, every at least every few years. And I think doing this is, will probably spur us to go out Like on if the we road were a again. couple, I think we'd probably renew our vows. And it's, uh, and I think one thing that's always been true of us, no matter even at the, at, even at the times when we were most fractious and fighting and you know and there would always be the moment when we actually got in, in front of each other to perform that all of that would go away. Even going back to the Rivoli shows, you know, we'd fight all through the week getting the, the material together and then the, the show night everyone would fall in love with each other and we'd all just, you know, by the end of the night everyone just, you know, was loved the troupe. But this is amazing because it's both are seem to be working, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like we're enjoying each other in a way that yeah. we haven't. And it doesn't feel like a nostalgia. It's no, like, it doesn't at all. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, it is a bit unreal to be sitting here seeing all five of you and uh, you've done such great work for so long. And, uh, and it's just fun watching how well you guys are getting along together. And so thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. And, and hopefully this will stop you and Adrian from fighting on yeah. air so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come on. We don't need to see that. We will help bankroll the three other editors that are going to have to edit this. It's the sound together. editor who's going to kill himself. This yeah. is not airing anywhere. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Just one editor, Richard Grundy, who did a really nice job on that, though I noticed he left that last section in, which was kind of shout out, a shout out to him. Uh, the other thing is like a really interesting conversation. I hope you thought about the state of comedy now and we'll be posting it online later, so feel free to share it. We now know the new actor taking over as Doctor Who. Shuti Gatwa is stepping into the coveted science fiction role. Hey man, I'm- Handsome. <laughs> Sorry, you are- Eric. Eric. The Scottish actor is best known for the Netflix comedy Sex Education. He's the first black actor to play the Doctor. The show first appeared on TV back in 1963. Gatwa's take on the Time Lord will hit screens next year. This Mother's Day war is at the center of two emotional reunions. <laughs> Given up for adoption during the Second World War, a daughter finds her birth mother 80 years later, but first. My heart uh, was melted <laughs> at that time. A bittersweet reunion after one mother flees today's war. Two must-see stories right after this. This Mother's Day is one of unrest and upheaval for many families from Ukraine. With millions forced to flee, traditional celebrations have been upended. But for one family now in Canada, this Mother's Day is a special one. Nick Purden has the story of their long-awaited reunion. The most important thing for every mom is uh, children's life, actually. Only one cry, come here. Come here, please, as soon as possible. I'm in Peterborough, Ontario, and happy Mother's Day, a day where we honor the work and the sacrifice and the help that our mothers give us. I'm here to meet two moms from Ukraine. They've been through a lot in the last couple of months. And I'm wondering, what does it mean to be a mother when the country you're from is at war? Come and help. Only a few weeks ago, Irina and her daughter Victoria worried they might never get the chance to spend time together again. Irina Lotsitsia fled Ukraine eight years ago when Vladimir Putin invaded Crimea. And so when Russia attacked Ukraine this past winter, Irina didn't hesitate. Right away, she called her daughter and told her to get out. We called. Suddenly, they were sleeping. And we demanded, uh, go from there, go from there, please, because you are in danger. Mm, I had no time even to think. I, uh, it was just minutes, minutes for us to take our children and go away. We <laughs> sit in our car and just go, 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 don't stop. <laughs> Victoria Holobrodko and her three kids made it to Poland. <laughs> and then soon after, the family was reunited at the airport in Toronto. 
I will never forget that moment when they came and uh, we see each other. What did you do? Uh, just hug and cry. <laughs> My heart uh, was melted <laughs> at that time. It's really uh, the happiest moment in, in my life. Now that mother and daughter are finally together and safe, I wonder what this Mother's Day means for them. This uh, will be first Mother's Day for me when I have my whole family around me. Mm -hmm. I am the happiest mom in this Mother's Day. I think this Mother's Day is special for me uh, because uh, it's actually uh, like a second chance for me. Second chance to start not only my life, but to give a new uh, life for, to my children. Um, and I am very glad that I have this chance with my mom near me. Three generations now live in the house together. And it's not lost on Victoria's daughter, Sophia, how her mother helped her escape the war. I'm very grateful to my mother that she bring me to Canada. And uh, I uh, believe that uh, she will be with me uh, in all my life and uh, always can protect me. You are a very smart girl. <laughs> now that the family is back together... Do you remember those moments? Yeah, of course. They have a chance to remember the happy times in Ukraine. And Victoria says her mom has always been there for her. So my mom uh, always supported me during my life. She is really um, like center of my universe. I don't know. <laughs> she uh, is that person that always have some advice and always do anything, anything possible and anything impossible for me. <laughs> That's why this day is also special for me. Nick Purden, CBC News, Peterborough, Ontario. When we come back, a mother-daughter reunion, 80 years in the making. You're my mommy. And I've been telling my kids about that. I've been telling all my friends about that. Sweetie. How one woman got to meet her long lost daughter on her 98th birthday. The amazing meeting is next. It's been a long journey. 80 years ago, Gerda Kohl was a teenage Jewish refugee fleeing persecution in Europe. At the height of the Second World War, she made a difficult choice to give up her daughter for adoption. Mother and daughter had never met until this weekend. Gerda is now 98. She lives in long-term care in Toronto. Sonia is 80 years old, living in the UK. Sonia's son made the connection to his grandmother while he was researching his lineage. So they flew here just in time for Gerda's birthday and Mother's Day. And this touching reunion is our moment. This is amazing. This is amazing. This is so amazing. Oh my God. I've got this funny feeling in the bottom of my stomach. I'm shaking. Up until just over a year ago, I didn't know that my mother was still alive. I, I, I knew very little. I still don't know much, and there's a thousand questions I've got to ask her. I found out all of the information here. I knew that my, my mother uh, had been adopted, and we didn't know anything about her birth parents. I finally get in touch with someone who said, you won't find a death certificate because your grandmother is still alive at the age of 97 and living in Canada. I was like, oh my God, that's just blown my mind. The idea that her mother was still alive and she would have the opportunity to meet her was so exciting. Do you remember about giving me up? One day I remember was at the courthouse where I had to sign you away. And I was screaming, and they couldn't do anything with me, and I had no choice but to put my signature there. And then I was so upset that I didn't care what happened. 
You know, my mommy. And I've been telling my kids about that. I've been telling all my friends about that. Yeah, my sweetie. A miracle. I can't think of it any other way. And I thank God for it. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> How incredible is that? So Gerda's birthday was yesterday, and today, of course, Mother's Day. So even that timing working out so nicely. And the son was was uh, researching the lineage because he was trying to get Austrian citizenship, lives in the UK, and that's when he uncovered the documents showing, as you just heard, that his grandmother was still alive and well. Wow, that is the national for this Mother's Day, May the 8th. Good night. <laughs>